we have to have patience. It'll take time. So it's not a pipe dream. It's a tough journey. The politics around us has changed significantly in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. While we have made a lot of progress, politics has become much more aggressive than it was 10 years ago. The government themselves was not convinced that bus is an option the citizens will consider when there is so much concentration of power. It is inconceivable that any time in the near future that there is going to be a quick transfer of power to city governments. These are all manifestations of extreme competitiveness. We didn't see this in such great degree earlier. So what, what does that do to us? It slows down progress. All across, we can see the kind of money that is flowing into politics today is unbelievable. Are we on? Let's go. Welcome to another episode of the Uru Labs podcast from Bengaluru. Ever complain how bad our cities are, how bad your commute is? You'll get to hear from people who are working to solve these problems in their own way. This is your weekly soapbox for urban sustainability. I'm your host, Satya Shankaran. As an alumni of IAM Bangalore, apart from her rewarding career at the executive levels of many corporates in the city, Revati Ashok, our guest today, is the CEO of Bangalore Political Action Committee, or popularly known as BPAC in the city. It is a non-partisan citizens group that aims to improve governance in Bengaluru and to enhance the quality of life of every Bengalurian. BPAC is specifically targeting good governance practices integrity and transparency in all arms of the government, improving the quality of infrastructure in the city and identification, as well as support of strong candidates for public office at all levels with the B-Clip program. So this is something we want to talk to Revati about today. So welcome to the show, Revati. Thank you, Satya. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. So I'll jump in with the big question that I had when I thought of you and speaking with you. This good governance that we have all been working in and you've done a lot of work with your cohort and with your people and everything else. Is this a pipe dream? What do you think? What is good governance that we are chasing? Maybe you can take a stab at defining it and how you think about it. Uh, I did read some out of the introduction of uh, BPAC itself. But what is good governance and is it a pipe dream? Let's try and answer that. What do you think? So let me take the second part of it first. Mm. If it were a, a pipe dream, then BPAC should not be existing. Mm. The very fact that we are going uh, 10 years strong, this is our 10th year and it's my pleasure to be with you today, that we have existed for 10 years. We have survived multiple governments. We have tried to do many things. We have uh, put 365 engaged leaders into the city with tremendous amount of training and inputs in public policy and holding public office. We still strongly believe that there is a case for good governance. We have to have patience. It will take time. So it's not a pipe dream. It will happen. It is citizens' voices that must be continuously heard. Uh, we must put data in front of people. So that is what we try to do. And more on that when we do uh, uh, take on this conversation further. But let me come back on what is good governance. Mm. We, we believe that, you know, as much transparency as possible in public office and what is getting done and how it is getting done Involving citizens in the process of decision making to the extent it is possible, I think encapsulates public governance, good governance in the public sense here. And that is what BPAC has been trying to do. We do it through various ways. We do it through extensive citizen engagement, ex extensive engagement with the political leadership, extensive engagement with corporates extensive engagement with uh, bureaucracy. So we have mapped all the stakeholders and we engage with them significantly so that there is a platform of trust that if we are doing something, let's trust these people to do the right things. That's what we have tried to create, that in a city like Bangalore, let us uh, create a platform. This is a citizen's platform anybody is welcome to come and join this is not a closed user group anybody is uh, we welcome all all people 
to come come forth engage with us and engage with multiple stakeholders in whatever areas that interests different people and we do find that different people are interested in different things so we are just providing that platform to do many of these things i think in your answer you talked about two things transparency and engagement with citizens across the spectrum uh, these are predominantly not outcome oriented these are process oriented so transparency is a process of executing their job and you want it, access to information and engagement with citizens is something you are clearly asking for uh, how do you think we fare in these two areas over the many years and congratulations on your 10th anniversary and <laughs> it's nice to have you uh, is it today or is it this week or what is it is it this, is year, it a, this year. year okay it's it's a big <laughs> year but in the 10 years it's a full decade so it's good to talk about a decade of be back how do you rate the improvements in transparency and citizen engagement has one of one or two of these gotten better and where do you think the roadblocks lie in these two pieces at least? Yeah, I think uh, it's a tough journey. The politics around us has changed significantly in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. While we have made a lot of progress, politics has become much more aggressive than it was 10 years ago. Okay. I think that's a point to take, make a mm -hmm. note of. In spite of that, the ability to work with successive governments I think is a testimony to the fact that we try not to use the easy option out to, uh, you know, side with any political party to gain short term, any short term gains. But we st stay our course. We engage with all the political parties. Things may be slow, but eventually they, uh, they see the light of day. Do we think many things are going in the right direction? I would say some of the things that we started out seven, eight years ago, they're all moving in the right direction. For example, we spoke about waste management. I know we it's a very big subject and uh, issues are not resolved at all. Uh, we may all talk of indoor model and X model, but we have Bangalore is not indoor. Mm. It's a very large city. It's a metro, bustling metropolis, which is growing. It needs different solutions. But I think the fact that at least there is an active citizen group, there are active people working towards several of these. The first five to six years was even spent in educating people that, you know, waste management is something that is got to be hotly contested, hotly debated. It's an issue that we need to work upon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Similarly, let us take the case of mobility. Hmm. You know, that's my favorite subject, as you know, uh, where we've been working on several such, you know, several proposals with the government. Hmm. And we've been saying five years ago, we embarked on this journey to say that please push public mobility. Please ensure eight years ago, then Sidharamaya government, we said, Please increase the bus population in the city to 15,000. You will solve a lot of the mobility problems. It was very slow to take off. Uh, they understood, but there are there is also the political economy that we know, which is not very favorable to just putting buses. And therefore, people are more interested in putting road infrastructure, which cannot be evaluated that easily roads which are already built get built rebuilt and you know then there is this road history project so there are many things that happen and we are cognizant of the kinds of challenges we face nevertheless we keep pushing that agenda we won't let it die because we think it's a very important piece for example mumbai moves at least 80 percent of its people through suburban rail we don't have a suburban rail in the city and therefore, the city should move 50% of its, 80% of its people through buses till such time metro gains critical mass. For us, our comparison should not be the bus of Mumbai, but it should be our comparison should be the suburban rail of Mumbai. Till such time, we have our own suburban rail that we can talk about. Till such time, we have a metro which is very significant. I think we made... After years of pushing, finally, 
in the last government, last session, you were able to push the BMLTA bill. That was a very significant piece. While there were several people that supported us, we literally had to push it from table to table. Now our push is, you know, to get that implemented, to have the rules announced, to get that implemented. Because if you see the pilot, the uh, personal to public pilot, which happened in ORR, which has got so much publicity and we are all part of it, really required a BMLTA to be at the center of it, to say, I will put the citizen at the center of mobility and say, what does the citizen want and how do I integrate different pieces of mobility into what the citizen wants, which is stress-free commute with right information, timely, available with an app, book tickets, transact, all on the mobile. It is not correct for us to think that the average citizen or the uh, less advantaged citizen of Bengaluru is not able to use mobile. That is not a fact at all. You can see Bengaluru is one of the finest examples of how the UPI has just taken inclusivity by storm. And same would be the case if we integrate mobility solutions. We have not got there, but we have made some, you know, if you look at it like a jigsaw puzzle, there's a BMLTA, which has got like 60%, I would say, mm. there. The big hurdle has been crossed. Now the uh, 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 rules have to be announced. Then you have this P2P, which has taken off. So there is an understanding of feeder bus, et cetera, et cetera. Four years ago, before the pandemic broke out, we had done an extensive study on uh, feeder buses and last mile connectivity and had submitted to the government saying, you need to have extensive feeder buses in mall, places where there are big malls, hospitals, educational institutions, tech parks, etc., and retail areas. So if you do all of this, at least you, you can't possibly flood the city, but at least in all these areas, if you do this, you'll start decongesting part by part. I think this P2P uh, is an idea whose uh, time has come. And we see now positive responses from the government because they seem to understand that the citizen of the city is ready to use a bus. The government themselves itself was not convinced that bus is an option that city will consider, the citizens will consider. Uh, in their minds, the elite citizen will not travel by a bus. But that's not the fact. fact. The elite citizen, so-called elite citizen, I mean, if you can call the tech uh, community elite, that's not correct, but be that as it may, if they think that that community will not travel by bus, that's not a fact. They don't travel because they don't, as I mentioned earlier, they don't get information, the, the uh, level of hygiene, the level, the overall experience. So if you look at it, if they want to say mobility as the brand that they want to build, that I will give superior mobility experience, then you look at all the infrastructure that is there, not as standalone pieces, but mobility as a total experience mm. that I will deliver to the customer. So I think that change in thinking has still not come. It's a little bit market-oriented thinking. It, we are still more infrastructure driven rather than being citizen centric driven. So, uh, but I think the change is beginning to happen because the government after this P2P has also announced and the Shakti scheme also demonstrated to them that bus is something that people really appreciate in the absence of huge coverage of Metro. And let's get it. Metro can never cover and rail can never cover completely. They have, they are fixed pieces. Whereas the bus has the ability to navigate uh, uh, smaller roads and things, uh, areas where uh, these fixed lines cannot hope to get there. So we have a lot of work to do, but I think what we need to ensure is the pace is accelerated significantly. We are doing a lot of things in the right direction. 
but the pace is very very slow and it requires enormous patience we talked about two important projects uh, here one is the bengaluru metropolitan land transport authority for the viewers who are listening and not watching this on the video uh, bmlt is the unified metropolitan transport authority which was uh, something that we we pack at campaign for and uh, it, this was in the public domain for long years more than 20 years maybe this is an entity that will help bring together all transportation projects uh, in a way that it can be planned and executed seamlessly at the intent that's what it is uh, there's already an agency in karnataka which is unique called the directorate of urban land transport which has been doing but it was toothless and this was also highlighted by many people in the government that we end up the states end up creating toothless bodies uh, to serve its own interest and not necessarily create outcomes the other project revati just mentioned was called p2p personal to public this is a project that uh, be back uh, in association with wri and many others like us are a part of it in some way or the other uh, it's fear aiding the uh, movement to get people to uh, switch to public transport uh and there are a lot of different things that are uh, a part of that we can talk about it at uh, some length in some time but i want to come back revati to the broader issue of how the political class is looking at solutions for bengaluru we all know there are misalignments bengaluru still does not even have its own city government the MLAs are proxying it and the state government itself is running through all of its parastatals and administrators and the bureaucracies. Not that you will not get outcomes, but it's quite shameful that we don't have a city government at all. How are you looking at the political outlook for the city? What are they thinking? Why are the MLAs interested in, uh, are the state government not interested in creating a city government? What is the fear? I think uh, it's all economics. Mm. Uh, unlike okay. most other uh, cities, uh, uh, states, Karnataka doesn't have multiple cities which are hugely revenue generating. Mm -hmm. A significant portion, 70% of the entire taxes earned revenues come from uh, Bangalore city for Karnataka state. And therefore, there is a big corpus. And therefore, that is the power. That is where the power resides. When there is so much concentration of power, it is inconceivable that any time in the near future that there is going to be a quick transfer of power to city city governments and therefore recognizing sometimes the reality of situations we work very hard to create a minister for bangalore mm -hmm. you know knowing fully well that you know if you can't uh, win 100% you can at least get to 50% so in uh, term number one of the Congress government, we actually worked very hard to see whether the government could create a, a person who would be the point person for Bangalore City. Because when you mix it up with the state issues, everything pales into insignificance because the problems of other, uh, other areas are very different from the problems that we face. These are very, very highly urbanized problems. And if we don't address it now and we uh, benchmark it with the same kind of standards that you have for tier two and tier three cities, I think we will be doing uh, Bangalore a big disservice. And I think they be began to understand that. And we said, don't kill the golden goose, because if you don't give attention, this is your only revenue generating area. People will move away. And we have seen some of that. We've been... Uh, there have been wins, there have been losses. Uh, we could have done much better. Uh, but once again, we have uh, a deputy, deputy chief minister who has been assigned for Bangalore City. So we are happy that at least uh, there has been somebody assigned because even that became a very, very political issue. Everybody wanted to be the, uh, the person for Bangalore because that's where the power is. That's where the money is. Now, be that as it may, I think we need to continue to work through the system like this to see even if the end goal is not immediate, but I think we are directionally working in the... Our goal was to get somebody will, who will give focus. Mm. So hopefully we will get uh, enough focus to address some of these issues. Uh, as I said, we have issues of environment. 
we have done well in greening uh, green energy i think karnataka state has done very well compared to some of the other states mm. more than 50% of the uh, state is the green energy which is uh, fantastic uh, i think mobility we have done very poorly as i already mentioned uh, we can do much more on safety of women and children for the city we are very poor in uh, footpath infrastructure any city which is not as advanced or does not get the kind of corporate footfall which economic which generates so much economic value for the city still has better footpaths you mm. i travel extensively in mumbai in calcutta in chennai hyderabad all of them without exception have better footpaths mm. so there is something wrong in the way we not prioritizing it the kind of impact it has on mobility i don't have to tell you that you know that yourself being such an enthusiast on uh, active mobility so that is our goal active mobility bill has to be pushed uh, and we have to ensure that citizen is uh, is really the person at the center and uh, gets gets his or her right because it's a lot of people still tend to think mobility is an elite issue mm. it is not and i keep saying this just like we said a mobile phone everybody used to think is a very elite concept it has created huge inclusivity and as i mentioned upi similarly if you make mobility very central to uh, the way government and politicians start thinking it has a it's a great equalizer because a person living in dahisar or goregaon can walk come work in the center of town even if he or she is a clerk or a security guard or um, a bai can uh, come from dahisar and go back because there is public transport if you don't provide that they are forced to live very close to the city the heart of the city which is unaffordable so i think we need to understand that mobility can be a great equalizer while mumbai doesn't get many other things right it has got this thing right that it provides that you know, economic engine for people to be anywhere and work anywhere before we introduce bpac and its programs to the users i want to come back to your uh, statement on aggressive politics what is aggressive politics why has it become that way what do you see are its impact what how has that affected how we go forward and create results and outcomes so i think um, the world around us itself has changed a lot in the last 10 years i think some of the niceties that we used to see uh, are no longer considered as virtues it is uh, much more the strength that we need to uh, display uh, which is uh, seemingly valued across the world I, i don't want to pass any judgment as a result a lot of things have become extremely competitive you know uh, politically competitive so uh when i see whatever is happening we used to earlier have this very benign philosophy doesn't matter if the government changes but by and large things will keep moving it does move to a certain extent there is much more concern about will this be viewed as my program or will this be viewed as the other party's program for example i'm just giving one example mm-hmm. so to wanting to disassociate with programs that are considered xyz political parties program versus abc's political parties program these are all manifestations of extreme competitiveness we didn't see this in such great degree earlier so what what does that do to us it actually when we make progress it slows down progress because it's not that they don't believe in it but they think what is going unsaid mm. is will this be viewed as an endorsement of what they did and continuation of what they did and will the other political party take mileage out of it so give it a new name and uh, make it look different package it differently i mean we are okay let them package it let anybody package it anyway let the job happen right. you know let the service take place 
So these are the kinds of, uh, and of course, all across, we can see the kind of money that is flowing into politics today is unbelievable. I mean, it was there, but I think uh, when BPAC started, there was a wave of up and that feeling India against corruption. And there was a feeling that there was a new wave of politics that would sweep the country. I think that we all have come to realize is not going to happen. It's going to be that slow, uh, uh, I won't say steady, slow and turbulent way in which uh, our improvement in governance is going to happen. But technology is going to play a big role because as in, uh, as we disintermediate more and more and more and allow technology to be the first interface with the citizen, hopefully uh, this level of corruption and manipulation of citizens will come down. And we must embrace that with all gusto. That's a useful point because it also determines how over the past decade we are also beginning to see what the government should actually do and what they should not. The more you put the eggs in the government basket of running critical services, there are issues that come up with it. I can take the classic case of whether it is uh, our power supply or mobility or anything. We are unable to get the state agencies or the state run agencies or the operating agencies to uh, run faster, right? Uh, I've not seen the, uh, I don't know how, uh, how you think about this. I've not seen that embracing of the market in these solutions so easily uh, because of the entrenched way in which people are running. I'm not saying uh, privatize as a word in itself that's too black and white. Uh, the, in, the increase of acceptance of private solutions in a lot of these places over the last 10 years has become increasingly uh, important because we are running very fast. The city is growing very fast to the level of overheating and we are not able to solve some basic problems. Some some things have to be done by the, the, the safety thing that you mentioned is very interesting. How can you not have a decent infrastructure like footpaths and, you know, things like that for the people? Uh, how can you still have so much of power shutdowns and things like that in, 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 a, in something that can support? What Where do you see the acceptance of the working of the bureaucracy itself at some point, has it improved, has it worsened? And have they accepted market a little better in some of the key solutions like mobility and uh, energy and waste and things like that? Have you seen improvements? You have been speaking with people. I must say that while uh, I think there has been uh, an increasing dialogue with the, uh, with the government and uh, citizen groups on various issues, uh, 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 while it takes time, uh, they eventually they have to be convinced. And I've realized over time, sometimes all it takes is two, three very strong officers who are willing to take take the bet, and one or two strong politicians who are really willing to lead the charge. And we have to grab those moments in time. And that happens rarely in a 10-year span. But when it happens, you have to just grab it and grab their attention and try and get things done. Because then, again, you don't, there are, uh, whether it's politics or uh, government, you find people who are good people, but who will not take the bull by the horn. I think we have to grab those moments of opportunity and have to be very sagacious about it. So that's point number one. Therefore, working with governments extensively and finding those slots where we can, we have good officers, just just go and work with them very deeply at that moment. Our success with providing, again, as you said, not privatizing, but providing private services for what is considered as purely a public service has, I think, been very, very limited. Uh, mobility itself is a case in point. If you look at financial inclusion, because it's a national, and I keep coming back to this because truly, we, uh, as a nation, we have built a digital infrastructure highway mm -hmm. where uh, people can, private sector can come and build applications on top of it. It's an open architecture. Similarly, we, we can do a whole lot of things. A similar analogy can be taken to mobility because if we have open mobility with data being provided at that platform layer, 
then people can come and build, private sector can come and build applications on top of it. Just as you said, uh, just as we have the UPI layer, it doesn't matter whether it's a Bharat Pay or a uh, Pay You or Google Pay or uh, Amazon Pay or whoever it is. It's all on a UPI layer. So I think it is very, very important to have mobility such a key aspect of the city it's absolutely ripe for open data. And we've been talking about this. They're still not uh, so convinced. You know, we have to, we had to traverse six to seven years of mindset where BMTC used to view BMRCL as its biggest competitor. You know, that is the mindset. Each uh, one mobility arm is competing with the other mobility arm. How can we even think of, where are they even thinking of citizen? They are far away from that. They are sort of competing with each other. There is absolutely with that mindset, there is no space for a private sector to even think of providing a service. So if you see Metro Ride, which has been successful in other cities, which is an EV auto service, which goes point to point from Metro to residential localities, where it is not feasible to provide feeder buses. Uh, similarly, but they are providing, uh, Metro provides uh, parking facilities for these people mm. at market rates. It's not going to be feasible for them to charge 20 rupees for round trips, uh, uh, for trips, if they, are going to, uh, uh, if they are going to pay such a huge parking fee. Whereas in other cities, they have been welcomed with open arms. Similarly, uh, and our neighboring uh, states have welcomed them with open, open arms. Same is the case um, with uh, entities like Zipgo, startups, several startups who started here and said it is impossible because, you know, everybody feels it's a competition to their, their business, which is not. Actually, their business will grow so much more when there is so much integration. And I think that is something uh, which is at least now with this feeder service, uh, BMRCL and BMTC are not viewing each other as competition, but they are at least, I won't say we haven't reached the level of cooperation, but at least they are not viewing completely as competition. So um, open data is, uh, we are a little far away. We have to continue to push, but we've been pushing this for five years. But this is a good point to jump into what is BPAC? Why was it set up? What are its goals? And what have we done so far? That will be a nice way to start. BPAC uh, is a product of several people who felt, uh, let me name uh, Kiran Malandar, Mohandas Pai, Jairaj, a, a few of the people, Ashwin Mahesh in the earlier days before he embraced politics. Uh, because we want to remain apolitical. If people are in politics, we have to gracefully allow them to move on with their ambition. So. Um, the idea was to create a number of problem solvers and not complain always about issues. We said, why not we create a number of problem solvers? Let us be an organization that is not, uh, it's not an activist organization. We are a people who gather together to find solutions. We will work with different political parties to find solutions for issues that are faced by citizens. And it is, uh, it is not a close group at all. It's a platform for any citizen to come and engage. Uh, we have mapped multiple stakeholders. The, the multiple stakeholders would be corporates, uh, citizens, uh, polit politicians, government, uh, et cetera, and different cohorts of people. And they all want to engage in different ways and everybody wants to do good. This is a great platform to get things done in the city. And uh, we, uh, our flagship program was the B-Clip program, where we said... Before I, this... jump into, before I jump into B-Clip, I want to touch upon this pack itself, right? The, the, the term political action committee in other countries are usually uh, huge industries, are putting in money, sponsoring programs and expecting something in return. How is your PAC different? Why did you call it PAC? I, I did speak with you before the call. You were saying this is not the traditional PAC in how we understand the political action committee. How is uh, the Bengaluru PAC different from all these traditional models we have in our mind? So the difference between the, the primary difference, of course, 
is they are all uh, the packs outside the country, especially the US, they all belong to a political party and a political mm. ideology. Mm. Uh, we, we are very different in the sense we yet wanted to call, call it. There was a big debate. Should we call ourselves political action committee or uh, uh, you know, public action committee? And there was a big debate and everybody said, we should not use the polit word political because then there is connotation of politics. And really speaking, the final debate uh, clincher was we cannot wish away the, the role of a politician in city governance or a state governance or a country's governance, right? That is so integral. If the more we move away, the more we, this, as citizens, we cede power to somebody and less democratic we become. So we wanted to, as an organization, bridge this yawning gap which has arisen. If you trace the last 75 years of history, if you look at the freedom struggle, there were women who gave um, their ornaments for the freedom struggle. That was a different era. Today, we struggle to raise money at BPAC, except for a few benefactors. We struggle to raise even you know, a few lakhs. And therefore, that is the difference uh, and the indifference, I would say, that has crept up in, in the minds of citizens, corporates, community. Magically, there is an expectation that somebody will resolve this problem. Like frequently, I get calls and saying, uh, somebody says, oh, you're working on city issues. Why don't you solve this? Uh, we have this garbage problem here. Why don't you solve it? Or we have a big problem on mobility. Why don't you tell somebody? Say, my point is, why don't you tell them? I will give you the tools. I will tell you how to engage. I will tell you whom to meet. I will take away the information asymmetry. And I will make, make it easy for you. But you please engage. I don't want to engage. I am not the spokesperson for the whole city. If you have a problem, there are people with whom you can go and engage. But people don't want to take that effort. There is too much of armchair conversation that goes on without people wanting to soil their hands and actually spend time and effort. You know, you've been at the heart of so many of these things, how much time and effort it takes. And it's uh, basically Saturdays and Sundays and after work hours and during work hours. And it's, it's a lot of effort. This is the classic man in the arena problem. Uh, of uh, Roosevelt's right so unless you get your hands dirty there's no point in sitting and creeping on the road, uh, side you need to get yourself involved but that uh, there are many ways in which you've tried to do this right over the years you've uh, done a lot of programs I see a lot of bees there but the bee clip is very interesting for me maybe you can start with that the civic leadership incubator program uh, what is it what is it actually doing uh, and why did you create it this is the at the heart of participatory democracy. Now, when we talk of things like participatory democracy, it's too big a concept for the average citizen to really appreciate. So uh, before I go into B-Clip, the heart was citizens must participate more. Uh, uh, just a, a couple of minutes ago, I said, people are very happy to come and tell you, why don't you solve this? And I say, I will give you the tools. And we said, Okay, if participatory democracy is too big a concept for an average citizen to really appreciate it enough to give, give their time and attention, then what is it that will uh, get us their time and attention? Then we created a, what we call our verticals. The verticals are mobility, safety. So it's be mobile, be safe, be proud, heritage. Uh, be engaged. So having political discussions or discussions on several issues which are important for the city, if it's, let's say, a delimitation exercise, uh, now we are planning a delimitation conversation, we are planning a DPDP, that is the Digital uh, Data Protection Act and what it means for the citizen. So we are planning several of these conversations. So the, that is on dialogue. Then be accountable where we uh, look at all the funds utilization, what is out there in public domain, whether it is MLA funds or other funds which are given to various wards, where they have been spent, how they have been spent and put it out on public domain. There are people who are interested in working on that. There are people interested in working on different streams. Um, 
uh, be green, which is all about sustainability. So uh, I think we are trying to bring different people uh, with their uh, different interests to engage with the political leadership and the bureaucracy in a productive mat manner, in a sol solution oriented manner. Weekly was interesting. I wanted to know more, which is you okay. have now. 365 people out there at the end of the B clip program. What does the B clip program do to these people? Why do they go through this? And what are you expecting them to do at the end of it? And what kind of people maybe can enroll as well? It would be useful for people to know. We speak about citizen engagement. We said there are several people, and we started as this as an experiment. We didn't re really know whether it'll work or not, but we said why not create an incubator? We are known as startups. There are st multiple startup incubators. Why not start a political and civic incubator? And to enroll people, we, we, we took about, we take about 60, 60 people uh, as part of, we have run about uh, eight cohorts now. Mm -hmm. And we take about 50 to 60 people at any uh, cohort. There'll be always a few dropouts. So we take a little more and we hope to end with about 50. Uh, it's a it's a program where we equip people who have interest in being strong civic leaders and giving them the tools by which they can formally engage with, as I mentioned earlier, the political leadership and the bureaucracy. So they go through some extensive training on constitution, law, uh, right to information act, so many other things. Uh, we take them to the uh, Vidhan Sauda. They can watch the sessions which are going, assembly sessions uh, that are going on. They can understand how the debates come up. They We tell them how they can uh, give various questions uh, to the various uh, MLAs to be uh, asked at the session. So these are all the kinds of things we equip them to. Then uh, uh, with all of this, we also uh, do a ward mapping exercise where People walk around their wards uh, and understand what exactly are the issues because we've got so, uh, we don't even see the problem sometimes in front of us. We've got so used to it, we just move on with our lives. So really to document the issues and then make, uh, at the end of the period, just make a presentation at the end of the uh, uh, three-month session, classroom session, they make a presentation on how they would like to what improvements they would like to see in their ward. So basically make them think very critically about issues uh, around governance and ward level civic issues. Because the ward level is the, the smallest unit at which governance is active. So mm -hmm. encourage them to participate in ward committees, etc. So the idea is all these vertical programs that we spoke about, these solution, uh, these are solution providers. Our B-Clip leaders are leaders who are very, very passionate about uh, uh, services, various aspects, and different people. There are lake activists who are going across, pushing uh, lake activities. There are other people. The, there are a couple of doctors during COVID time when nobody was going out in the city, they were going across the city in two wheelers with medicines which they had got and going door to door supplying medicines and supplies to people who were desperately in need. That is the kind of commitment. And these are not normal citizens. They are deeply passionate and it gives them a sense of identity when they do some of this. It's all voluntary activity. It's a different, it's opened my eyes to a different world that these are people who simply contribute because they want to do something and that they derive, they're not getting any money for it. They just, it is their sense of identity and the reputation that they have in their communities for having something, done something good. And that's the kind of cadre of people that we have built. And the most successful ones are the people who have come from grassroots. The interesting thing about this is, who do you admit into such a program? As long as you are, because we want to ensure that if they want to stand for political office, they should be eligible. They should have a voter ID. They should have all the requirements that are 
to be fulfilled if they have to stand for elections. Apart from that, they have a written exam, they have a, uh, they have an interview, they have to give 100 recommendations. And the most difficult part is getting those 100 recommendations. What we think is with our programs like Be Safe, like all other mobility and Be Engaged and Accountable, etc., etc., multiple programs that we have, you know, Be Green, we can translate those 100 recommendations into you know 5,000 over time because we have given them structured programs that they can run in their respective wards. They can do multiple things. So, uh, you know, uh, there are some leaders who are so good at uh, looking at government schemes. Across the city, they are helping people access government schemes. There are some people who are so good at, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, providing uh, grassroots empowerment to women that they have partnered to provide paralegal support to a lot of women who are facing domestic violence. So we've given them all a platform to express themselves in ways that they are passionate about. And that's how these verticals sort of work with our B-Clip. It gives, us, gives them structured programs. And they can, of course, they are free to do other programs and they are continuously doing. The beautiful thing is more than 200 of them are holding political party positions. Uh, this doesn't mean that they are elected members. That, I said, is very competitive. You ask me what has happened, the money involved. By the way, we were told that the money involved in Bangalore City is one of the highest in the country. Wow. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's a reality. And therefore, uh, that, has, that has fundamentally changed. But I think what... Uh, uh, what has really uh, happened is all these people are holding good party positions. Like somebody is a, one of our leaders, uh, Kaveri Kedarnath, was a housewife when she joined us. Yeah, she I know her. Blew, you know her, right? She, she, was, she became the right hand for Ashwat, Dr. Ashwat Nara and she became the first Mahila Mandal president of the BJP in Malayshuram constituency. That's a very big deal. And it's not easy to, um, uh, it was not a woman Mahila Mandal, Mahila Mandal presidents, men and women. She became that and gaining that confidence, gaining that platform, gaining that visibility would have been very difficult just as a housewife saying, I'm interested in politics. So I think we have seen transformation of many of our leaders over time, blossoming into and contributing to political parties and their thinking in several good ways. So we are very excited. I think the metric to look at success of these programs is engagement, positive engagement, making a difference, not only getting elected politically, because that's a very, that has become a very different game. I and think we so. realize that we have to really reevaluate. Now, this uh, BPAC was a product of um, uh, India against uh, corruption and a positive offshoot of something when thinking was in that direction. But I think uh, it is becoming increasingly clear that is nowhere in sight. But we have to work, we have to uh, retool ourselves and provide different ways to make these people effective and very relevant and get citizens' voices heard to do the right things. Fair enough. I was just looking at the Civic Hub and I know almost all of them there. <laughs> and uh, very powerful people. They've done a lot of hard work. The amount of hard work those people put in. Well, they've become uh, brands amazing. under themselves. I know. And uh, our goal is to have about 1,000 such people in the city. And if we have 1,000 problem solvers over time, uh, let's look at it this way. And a person who graduated out of IAM didn't, didn't become a CEO on day one. Mm. 25 years later, we suddenly see there is a CEO, there is a managing director. We are thinking at some point we will soon see, uh, we already had one MLA, which was Saumya Reddy. Uh, we had a few cooperators. Uh, Sampat Ramanujam is one mm. uh, who is the Panchayat. Sigeli. Um, Sigeli Panchayat. So uh, we had Sampat Kumar. So uh, uh, so we we have had uh, Chenagiri Appa, Chenagiri Appa nominated cooperator. So we have had some successes. Their ability to push good governance um, in different political offices they hold is also equally high. 
you know, there can be many quiet voices within who can who will be doing all the right things. I was just thinking at some point when you were speaking about the CSR funding for a lot of these kind of things. I do understand. I uh, just wanted to your views on this. I don't have any thoughts on this. It just occurred to me. CSRs are generally not funding some of the civic things and the, some of the green things that we look for in general. They do fund a lot of the activities that uh, are humanitarian in nature, which is complementing education, health and all that. I'm not denying that those are good things to do as well. And that is being done. That is a necessary part of nonprofits who are supplementing the government in those areas. But there are some unique things like, I don't know, the work that you do. There is uh, there's the stuff that I do around cycling and things like that. CSR generally not, it's not fitting within their framework. Do you think uh, that's an area that could change? Is there, if, if, if uh, some CSRs would come and say, why don't we support leadership development in a sustained way at a large, uh, large enough level? Right. I mean, some of these health camps take a lot of effort. Where do you see the CSR funding for such kind of activities that some of us are involved in? I think it's a good question and it's a tough question. I think we face the same uh, same issues. I think uh, it requires extremely evolved thinking at the side of the corporate to even think of governance, because uh, as I said, for the common man, governance is esoteric. For the corporate, also it is equally esoteric. It is when they say that I'm uh, educating a poor child or I'm uh, providing health facilities to a poor child or I'm setting up a hospital. For them, that hugs at their, uh, tugs at their emotional uh, strings. But... When I say that, let us push for better governance, which itself will lead to eventually better education, better health delivery systems, better mobility delivery systems. I think they feel this is too far removed from actual outcomes that they want to see on the ground. That is why we need to have, we also have some programs uh, on actual uh, live programs on uh, environment and safety, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because we need to do our work mm. and also need to do other work, and we need to understand what they are willing to fund and will some things, but we will never do things just for the sake of funding. We have a certain verticals, we have mm. our B clip programs, we'll try to see whether we can make a fitment but if the fitment is not there then uh, you know it's that's why i say it is a struggle uh, it's a struggle and it is uh, it the original idea was this is something that each person in the city should contribute towards to for the betterment of the city uh, somewhat like how the freedom struggle was and as i said it was the product of at the backdrop of India against corruption, where we thought a lot of people will actually come forward and do this. But unfortunately, people have once again receded and it's always left to a handful to fund these kinds of activities. Because, uh, you know, we put everything out on public domain. We have everything uh, uh, audited. Uh, everything is out there. But it's always difficult to find people uh, to actually fund our programs. CSR is one, uh, it's a complex animal and it's getting more and more complex uh, with mm -hmm. the regulations getting tightened uh, because there has been misuse as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, there has been misuse and there has, so we are all uh, victims of that misuse that has happened in some cases maybe. Uh, Fair enough. So uh, I think uh, there's also been some, yes, there have also been issues of governance in some of the NGOs. So mm. all, all this has contributed because a lot of NGOs I've seen feel that they're doing good for society and therefore, you know, I don't need to follow the laws of the land, but the laws of mm. the land are what they are, whether they like it or not, they have to follow. They may be ill informed. So there are lapses uh, and they generally feel they are doing good, so they are above law. So that, mm. I think that doesn't hold good. And you, you have to run it professionally. You have to understand. If you don't understand, which is fine, you, you have to get the expert who will tell you what is within the framework of law and what is outside the framework of law and so that you don't break any of those. Now, 
having said that, I think uh, there are options for companies, even if it is not within their CSR ambit because they want to put certain things in CSR. Every company wants to build a brand, right? Mm. When they say ESG, etc., they want to build a brand of socially responsible, of being uh, uh, promoting good governance. They, uh, they, it's also uh, uh, how they communicate themselves to the rest of the world. You know, how do they present themselves? And there could be a small opportunity there. ESG is not really, again, uh, like CSR. It has, it is much maligned, much misused, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Under that overall framework, if companies are willing to be seen as much more socially responsible as more environmentally responsible uh, governance. It doesn't deal with city level government governance or state level. It, it deals with their internal governance. But at least f- from the point of view of stakeholder engagement, etc., if they are seen to uh, uh, support campaigns which are sustainable, they're seen to support, it doesn't help directly the ESG score because that is all about what they do for their company. But in that overall realm of building a brand that is environmentally conscious and socially responsible, there could be some things that uh, people could still think of doing. Last but not least, I want you to kind of uh, tell me this whole brand Bengaluru thing is going around. And I wanted to make this my favorite question to ask every guest, but let me pick on you today. Uh, What is brand Bengaluru and how do you think it should be crafted? What is a brand? Uh, in your opinion, what should it? What should Bengaluru's brand be, really? Let's look at what is Satya's identity. Okay. It has multiple identities, right? The identity that I know you as is as the bicycle mayor, but that's not the only interest you have. I'm sure, sure you have multiple other interests that we don't know about, right? So similar is the brand Bengaluru. The brand hmm. that we know very well and have come to love is startup city Mm. right but it's not just the startup city it's a beautiful city uh, a city that we can be proud of there are lots of interesting things happening there is the k100 project which naresh is pushing so that's something which is happening there is unbox bangaluru that prashant prakash is pushing and uh, that is beginning to they want to create it like a festival year on year like the Edinburgh and other festivals. And uh, there is BIC, which has become cultural. It's become a cultural hub. It has also become a hub where uh, informed conversations happen on various subjects. Uh, it's a place, meeting place for people. There is the MAP, which is, again, a privately funded museum, uh, which is one of the finest mu- museums in the country and possibly one of the finest in the world. Uh, which has uh, all art easily accessible, even digitally. You can today go to the MAP website and access all the art that they have and look at everything and enjoy it from your house. And when you go there, it is just mind-blowing. Similarly, that is privately funded. Then there is the Science Museum, which is also coming up, which is one of the finest, will be a very fine museum. So. There are lots of interesting things that are happening in the city. All of these collectively make us feel proud and it makes Bangalore exciting, a brand on its own, uh, unto its own, where citizens are deeply engaged trying to do uh, things for the city. We need to project all its multiple dimensions. The food street is coming alive now. Very shortly, it will be there. So I think we are beginning to make change in small ways, uh, trying to protect. We lose some, we win some, but on the whole, we are making some level of progress. So I would say articulating all of this in a way that we are a startup city, a sustainable city, a city which provides economic equality, which which is green, which is uh, safe, which has many elements to be proud of, which has better governance, which has beautiful lakes, 
which has beautiful uh, pathways uh, for people to walk. I think these are all the elements that will make Brand Bangalore stick uh, beyond uh, its moniker of startup city. So on that thought, I'd like to thank you, Revati, for uh, spending time and explaining all of the things that uh, uh, I had of you. Um, it's nice to see BPAC on its 10th year and hoping for years uh, to more decades of success and programs that will uh, help shape uh, some part of the city and uh, very impressed by your uh, B-Clip program and hoping to see it become bigger and stronger and different as well. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. And uh, here's to everyone else uh, to like, subscribe and share these videos and uh, see you all next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Satya. Pleasure to have been on this podcast.